All right, it's time to begin. Welcome everyone. We're so happy you are here. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jamie Seward, Senior Associate Director of Alumni Relations with the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Now, before we start the program, I'd like to acknowledge our wonderful sponsor, the Johns Hopkins Medicine Heart and Vascular Institute. I also want to encourage you to ask questions by typing them in the Zoom Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We'll try our best to answer your questions as time allows at the end of our program. Now, I have the pleasure of turning the program over to my colleague, Lisa Hannon, Director of Development at the Heart and Vascular Institute. Lisa? Thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much. It is my privilege to introduce this evening's speakers to you, everyone here on Zoom. I arrived at the Heart and Vascular Institute, if memory serves me correctly, about six and a half years ago. And when I arrived, I could barely pronounce electrophysiology or arrhythmia or atrial fibrillation, let alone spell them or tell you what they were. But the two gentlemen you will hear from this evening have been my tutors and they have taught me everything I know, which is not much, but they know much more about electrophysiology and atrial fibrillation and so much more. So it's safe to say you are hearing from some of the best folks in the field, and I hope you will enjoy this evening's lecture. One of our speakers, Hugh Calkins, serves as the Catherine Ellen Poindexter Professor of Cardiology. He is also the Director of the Electrophysiology Laboratory and the Arrhythmia Service. Dr. Ron Berger is the Nicholas J. Fortuyn Professor of Cardiology the co-director of our electrophysiology laboratory and the director of the cardiac electrophysiology fellowship program. And if my statistics are correctly, Dr. Calkins arrived as a fellow in 1986 at Johns Hopkins and Dr. Berger followed in 1993. Did I get that correct, gentlemen? So collectively between the two of them, we're talking of approximately 67 years, give or take a year or two, of experience in the field. So you will be hearing from folks who absolutely know what they're talking about. And I will stop talking so you can start hearing them talking. So I will pass the baton to Dr. Calkins, I believe. Right. Okay, can you see my screen? Looks perfect. Okay, welcome uh, everyone. Thank you for spending some of your time uh, with us. We love cardiac arrhythmias and trying to think about them and we love sharing some of our knowledge with you tonight. There's a huge amount to go through, but we'll try to touch on some of the high points and there'll be a lot of time for question and answers at the end. And if we don't get to your question, you can feel free to reach out or email either of us. So I'm going to give an overview of strategies and management of atrial fibrillation. I have several consulting relationships. So I'm glad we picked this topic for many reasons. AFib is an important arrhythmia for many reasons. First, it's common. It's the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia. It affects 5 million Americans. It's supposed to go to 12 million Americans by 2050. And the lifetime risk of developing AFib is about one in four. So it's extremely common. AFib is important because it increases the risk of stroke, and the strokes that occur from AFib are large debilitating strokes. The increased risk overall is about five-fold, so that's a very significant concern for patients with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is important for hospitals because it fills them up. It's the most common reason for a hospitalization for a cardiac arrhythmia. It also increases mortality. This is some data just showing that patients with AFib don't live quite as long as those without atrial fibrillation. It's also linked closely to heart failure and can cause heart failure. It's one of the reversible causes of heart failure, but that's another reason that's important. It's also linked to dementia. And the dementia and there's more and more uh, research uh, confirming the link between AFib and dementia, and that's obviously a concern. And finally, it reduces quality of life. This is a little study where they looked at six different measures of quality of life from physical functioning to vitality to mental health, emotional role, social role. The AFib patients are in light blue. The heart failure patients are in purple. 
and you can see, and normal patients are in green, and you can see if you have AFib, your quality of life is impacted significantly by that condition. Now, this is a beautiful little figure from the uh, from guidelines published in Europe, but really stress the importance of AFib. It can cause symptoms and make you unhappy from all the symptoms. It can make you lightheaded or dizzy or pass out, but it also increases your mortality, increases your stroke risk, increases heart failure risk. It can cause cognitive decline, depression, impair your quality of life, and it lands you in the hospital. So it's clearly an important topic to talk about. Now, when one thinks about AFib, there's certain risk factors for AFib you need to be aware of. The important ones, the most important ones I've underlined. And so the first is age. AFib's rare before 50. You hit 50, it starts to show up. By the time you're 80, one in 10 people have AFib. It's far more common in men than women. It's also far more common if you're overweight or if you have a family history of AFib, particularly at a young age before the age of 50. And it's more common if you drink a significant amount of alcohol. It's also linked to body size. The taller you are, the more likely you to have AFib. The bigger you are, the more likely you are to have AFib. Uh, so again, those are just some of the risk factors for this condition, but it's so common that lots and lots of people can get it, even if you don't have an identified risk factor. Now, when it comes to treating atrial fibrillation, we have what's called the four pillars of AFib management. First, you have to make the diagnosis. Then you think, want to think about stroke prevention first, because that's most important. Then you want to think about rate control, slowing the AFib down so you don't feel terrible. Then you need to talk about rhythm control. Do you combat the AFib and try to get the patient back to normal rhythm? And then you want to think about risk factor modification. Are there things we can do to lower the chance of AFib progressing or of developing atrial fibrillation. So when it comes to diagnosis, it starts with an EKG. This is just a 12 with EKG showing this irregular rhythm with a squiggly baseline, which is the AFib, which is quivering, which is what causes atrial fibrillation. And to make the diagnosis, you need either need a 12 lead EKG like this, or you need some type of monitor, which increasingly are things like Apple Watches or other gadgets that patients can buy uh, that show AFib for at least 30 seconds to make the diagnosis. Now, once you've made the diagnosis, we have to think about stroke prevention. And when you think about stroke prevention, you should be aware of something called the chads vas score. That's the score we use to decide which patients with AFib have a high enough stroke risk where it warrants being on a blood thinner. And, and this just shows what it stands for. If, you're, if your point score is two or more, we generally recommend anticoagulation. One point, consider it. Zero points, we generally don't recommend anticoagulation. And the variables we consider are heart failure or history of heart failure, Hypertension, age over 65 is one point, over 75 is two points. Diabetes, prior stroke or TIA, vascular disease. And in the old days, female gender was on this list. It's really been removed because female gender is not a, a significant risk factor. So it's, it's, it, if you're a woman, you want a CHADS VAS score of three or greater to definitely recommend anticoagulation. For a man, it's two or greater. The next thing you think about is rate control. AFib tends to make the heart go extremely rapidly. And so you wanna slow the heart rate down because if the heart goes too fast for too long, you can develop heart failure. In general, if someone's heart rate's going over 120 beats a minute for two, three weeks at a time, that will cause heart failure. So that's an important consideration. And current guidelines say that the resting heart rate when you're in AFib at rest at home doing nothing, will get an EKG should ideally be less than 80. Maybe less than 110 may be acceptable, but we really prefer less than 80. And there's medicines we use to slow AFib down. Beta blockers like Toprol, Atenolol, calcium channel blockers like Diltiazem, or Digoxin. Digoxin is now rarely used because it's relatively ineffective. The next thing I wanna to touch on is risk factor modification. There's a lot of data uh, uh, showing that patients with a lot of cardiovascular risks have more AFib and the AFib progresses faster and it's harder to treat. And those risk factors include obesity, and weight, obesity sleep apnea, 
uh, lack of exercise, hypertension, diabetes, alcohol, and stress. And I want to touch a little bit on the link between a obesity and atrial fibrillation. A lot of this work has been done in Australia. And here's one study showing that if you have AFib and if you're overweight, if you go on a diet, guess what? Your weight, your waist circumference will drop. These are the patients in the open bars that didn't go on a diet, and these are the ones on the diet. So your waist gets smaller, your body mass index goes down, and also your AFib goes down. One of the nicest studies I like looking at the link between AFib and weight was done in Australia where they took sheep and they either sent them to the smorgasbord or to the field. The sheep that went to the smorgasbord got extremely fat and they developed atrial fibrillation. And then when they had them lose weight, the AFib disappeared. And we really see the same factor in patients that if you're overweight, the pressures in your heart go up, inflammation in your heart goes up. Fat increases around your heart, which, which burrows into your heart, making AFib more likely. So it's something that we find is extremely important. Now, it's important to, to note that losing weight is something I recommend to most of my patients with AFib that are overweight. But actually accomplishing that is very, very, very hard. I have very few patients that are able to successfully do that. Now, if you can't do it with diet alone or diet and exercise, you can get bariatric surgery where they go in and they reduce the size of your stomach and do it. There's a variety of procedures. And there's been studies showing that if you lose weight with a gastric bypass, you'll have a lot less AFib and your AFib will be easier to treat. But this is a pretty big operation that I know I wouldn't be too thrilled to have all these tubes stuck in my belly to have that kind of a surgery. And so the exciting news is there's a new kind of medicine for weight loss called a GLP agonist. It's a glucagon-like peptide, and it improves blood sugar control. It leads to weight loss by suppressing appetite. It may lower your risk of AFib, kidney disease, heart failure, and stroke. It's given as a weekly injection. Again, it suppresses your appetite, and the average weight loss with the main drug is used for this is Wegovi, was 34 pounds in one study. I've had a number of patients recently started and within a month, they report they've lost 20 to 30 pounds. It's rather dramatic where they can see a pizza and just walk away having just a tiny bite instead of polishing off the whole thing. So anyhow, so this is very exciting. We need to learn more about it. We need to learn if weight loss with these drugs is also associated with less AFib, I bet it will be. I think this is certainly prefer preferential to getting your stomach stapled. Uh, so anyhow, good news, something to consider. And now I'm gonna spend the rest of the time, my, my part of the talk on rhythm control, trying to control the atrial fibrillation. To do that, we have antiarrhythmic medications, amiodarone, flecainide, multac, propafenone, sotalol, ticosin. These are listed alphabetically. The most powerful is amiodarone. Amiodarone also has the most side effects. It can affect your, your uh, thyroid, your liver, and your lung. So it's generally a final uh, drug of last resort. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, Ticosin is another excellent drug, but you have to come in the hospital for three days. Flecainide and Multac and Propafenone, we can usually start as an outpatient. So we try to individualize the drug for the patient and whether they failed other drugs and so forth. And these drugs are reasonably effective. And there recently was a big study done in Europe where they took patients with recently developed atrial fibrillation and put them mainly on antiarrhythmic drugs or a controlled placebo medicine. And they found that if you were on an antiarrhythmic drug, your risk of cardiovascular death, stroke, heart failure, and hospitalization, or unstable angina was reduced. So this was a positive study showing the value of trying to control atrial fibrillation. In this case, it was mainly medicine, some catheter ablation. And then in the remaining minutes, we're gonna go over catheter ablation, which is basically how I and, and Dr. Berger spend much of our time performing these procedures. So AFib comes from what's called the pulmonary veins. This is the left atrium, the left upper chamber of your heart, a CT scan. These tubes are the pulmonary veins and AFib is triggered from fibers in those veins that go crazy as you get older. So what we do is we burn a roadblock around these veins so the electrical impulses can't get from the veins 
into the body of the atrium to cause atrial fibrillation. Now, this procedure can be done either by burning a ring of pearls with what's called heat radio frequency, as shown in this panel, or we can use a freezing balloon system where we free the, freeze the veins. We typically start with freezing the veins. If we have to do a second procedure, we use the ring of pearl approach, but both are, are, are quite effective. In terms of efficacy with one procedure, if you're a good candidate, the success rate is 60 to 80%. I tell patients, if you're an optimist, think 80. If you're a pessimist, think 60. If you're a bad candidate, if you've been in AFib for three years or longer or terribly obese, the success rate falls. And with multiple procedures, success rate, cumulative success rate goes up. Now, complication rates have improved dramatically since we started doing this procedure 20 years ago, and now they're in the 1% to 2% range. So if you're considering this, you want to hear about the potential risk, but fortunately, they're remarkably uncommon. When you think about AFib, it's also important about you know, why should you do the procedure? Well, the proven benefits are to eliminate AFib or reduce your AFib burden, get rid of the AFib or cut it dramatically down. The procedure on average reduces AFib burden by 99%. And you also want to improve quality of life. And both of these have been shown that if you have the procedure, both of these things will be accomplished in most patients. There's also the unproven or theoretical benefits of the procedure, reducing your risk of stroke, stave off dementia, prevent heart failure, make you live longer, and prevent a lifetime of AFib due to a stretch scarred atrium. Not all of these have been shown to be, have been proven in a prospective randomized clinical trial, although I suspect each of these is correct and will ultimately be proved, shown to be more reasons to perform this procedure. This just shows the indications if you have AFib with symptoms and the AFib's intermittent, you can either go straight to catheter ablation or try a drug. If your AFib's more recalcitrant, oftentimes we'll try a drug first. Uh, and the longer you've been in AFib, the harder it is to control it. Now, a few comments on what's new, because we always like to push the boundaries at Johns Hopkins and help develop new and better approaches, and we have a very active AFib ablation research program. So one of the very novel approaches we've developed is working with Natalia Trianova in the engineering school, where we take patients getting in who have AFib referred for an ablation, we do an MRI so we know exactly where the scar is in their heart. And then we do computational modeling in a supercomputer to figure out where the super the potential circuits are. And we use that to guide exactly where we ablate. So this is personalized medicine where we we, we, we the, the lesion set, the lesions we deliver are not the same for every patient. They depend on how much scar you have. We're doing a clinical trial of this approach. It's a prospective randomized clinical trial supported by the NIH. So if you'd like to hear more about that, please let us know. There's also new tools we've been working with in clinical trials. One is the super cold freezing catheter. This is made by a company called Adagio. A standard cryoablation goes to about minus 40 degrees centigrade. This catheter goes to a minus 100 degrees centigrade. It's more than twice as powerful. And this is being studied for recalcitrant persistent atrial fibrillation. We're a clinical trial with this catheter. The results are encouraging. So stay tuned to see if it gets released in the market. Another catheter we were involved with clinical trials a few years ago is called the Helios catheter. We use radio frequency energy, but delivered through this balloon makes the procedure quicker. Uh, it speeds up how quick the procedure is, where you can isolate the veins with one application of energy. This has just been approved by the FDA, and we should be starting clinical use fairly soon. Now, the final thing I'm going to touch on is the most exciting thing in the field of AF ablation today, which is called electroporation or pulse field ablation. In the old days, to kill tissue, we used heat or freezing. Now we're going to use electrical energy where we give an electrical impulse that pokes holes in the cells and kills the cells of the heart, and it's tissue specific. So things like the phrenic nerve and the esophagus and the pulmonary veins that we don't want to, that we don't want to harm or immune to damage with this kind of energy, and yet this kind of energy is very good at creating lesions in the heart. So this is called electroporation, and every company in the field is working with an electroporation system. 
And again, we're fortunate that they all come to us to have us participate in the clinical trials. And I imagine some of you may have been enrolled in some of these clinical trials. Now, the potential benefits of this new ablation energy is higher efficacy, fewer complications, a shorter procedure duration, no risk of injuring the esophagus, of narrowing the veins, or injuring the phrenic nerve. And again, the procedure is significantly shorter because when you give the energy, it takes about a second to apply the energy, whereas with the freezing balloon, for example, it takes three minutes with each application of energy. Now, what's the style of clinical trials? And we've been participating in all these clinical trials. The Medtronic study is complete, and the results are actually going to be presented the week after next at the American College of Cardiology meeting on Monday as a late-breaking clinical trial. This will be the first FDA-supervised PFA pulse field ablation trial ever in the world. So this will undoubtedly end up in the newspaper. And I can't tell you the results. I know the results, but stay tuned for that. There's another clinical trial we participated in, the Ferripulse trial. It's a randomized trial comparing the old tools with the new tools. That should be reported, the results in August or September of this year. There's another Admire trial, the enrollment's complete. That's going to come out probably September to November. And then there's more trials coming, and we're lining up our clinical trials unit to, to allow us to participate in each of these new tools as they become available. So let me just conclude that AFib is a very common and important arrhythmia. Once you make the diagnosis, first think stroke and should you be on a blood thinner. Increased data support the value of rhythm control, not just allowing the AFib con to continue, but combating it. You can accomplish this with drugs or procedures. Uh, the, the outcomes of catheter ablation continues to improve. This electroporation pulse wave ablation is eagerly anticipated, and this may be a quicker, safer, faster way to do the procedure. And so with that, I'll stop, and I will turn the, 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 the microphone over to my colleague, Ron Berger. Thanks very much. Um, see if you stop sharing, then I think I'll be able to share. Let's see. There we go. Okay, is that coming through? Yeah. Terrific. Well, listen, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak with all of you and to be a participant and a panelist in this webinar. I know I have uh, patients and I think some colleagues who are attending this and I'm delighted to be able to speak on one of the four pillars that Dr. Calkins talked about. I'm going to specifically talk about stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation, really with a focus on an intervention called left atrial appendage closure uh, as a treatment strategy um, uh, for stroke prevention. And so, uh, I intend to explain the rationale for left atrial appendage closure and um, to have uh, the participants here learn about the Watchman device in particular and other left atrial, uh, left atrial appendage closure devices as well. And as Dr. Calkins mentioned, we look at atrial fibrillation as um, uh, part of what pre presents stroke risk. But in addition, we quantify it um, by how many of these risk factors the individual patient has. Uh, we have the, the chads vask risk score with different points for each of the different factors, just as Dr. Calkins mentioned. And the more of these uh, risk points one has, the higher the annualized stroke risk. And you can see that if somebody has even just two or three of these risk factors. The annual stroke risk is on the order of, look at the orange part of these bars, um, about 3% per year. But that means over the course of a decade, the stroke risk, if left untreated, is about 30%, multiplying the annualized risk by number of years. Now, I just want to take a little bit of a tangent and talk about the two studies that demonstrate that stroke risk is not limited to only when patients are actually in atrial fibrillation. These are two studies from 
about a decade or longer ago, one called the TRENDS study and the other, the ASSERT study. And they're similar. Both studies took about 2,500 patients with an implanted device, pacemaker or an implanted defibrillator that uh, is capable of recording every minute that a patient is actually in atrial fibrillation. And patients were followed by one and a half years in one study and two and a half years in the other. And what was interesting was that in one study over the course of follow-up, 40 patients had a stroke or, or, or similar kind of uh, event. And in the other study, about 50 patients. In the trend study, 20, half of the 40 patients had no atrial fibrillation detected during the entire follow-up, even though they'd had a stroke. And only 11 out of the 40 patients had uh, a recorded episode of atrial fibrillation within 30 days prior to the stroke. And similarly, in the ASSERT study, uh, 33 of the 50 pa 51 patients had no prior AFib, and only four of them had had AFib detected within 30 days of their stroke. And the way we interpret this is that AFib is a marker of patients who are at stroke risk, but not the actual cause. And therefore, we don't believe that mere suppression of AFib is a reliable strategy for stroke prevention. Now, as Dr. Calkins mentioned, it may be that we find that ablation provides somewhat more robust stroke prevention than we currently believe. But for right now, we view uh, ablation and antiarrhythmic drugs as a way to prevent the symptoms of atrial fibrillation, but we rely, we need to rely on a more robust strategy to prevent stroke from atrial fibrillation. Now there's a conundrum when it comes to atrial fibrillation related stroke. And that is that when you look at those CHADS VASC risk factors that Dr. Calkins mentioned and I have listed here, and if you look at risk factors for bleeding, a lot of them are the same. Hypertension, advanced age, prior stroke. A lot of these are the, the same factors that predispose one to stroke are the factors that predispose to bleeding. And bleeding is exacerbated if one is on an anticoagulant drug. So for many patients, the question comes up, is there an alternative to blood thinners or anticoagulation for stroke prevention in AFib patients who are at high risk for both stroke and bleeding? And before I get to what the potential solutions would be, let me make the point that the problem, the culprit, if you will, in atrial fibrillation is the left atrial appendage. This is where clots form that can break loose and go to the brain and cause a stroke, the left atrial appendage. Now, when you look at a cartoon like this, it's hard to understand why this would be a problem. The left atrial appendage, what is it? Just like the intestines have an appendix, turns out one of the four chambers of the heart, the left atrium has an appendix or an appendage, the left atrial appendage, and it looks like an innocent little thumb. But in reality, it's quite an interesting and complex structure. Here's a CAT scan of a patient who came for stroke prevention with atrial fibrillation. And you can see that this left atrial appendage is a rather large, lobulated, uh, almost fungating kind of a structure with lots of little nooks and crannies where clots can form. And this is the problem of atrial fibrillation. Why do we have left atrial appendage? Why do we all have a left atrial appendage? You know, this probably gave us some advantage in evolution along the way, but at this point, the only purpose is to give me job security. Um, and so this is where clots form. There are a number of studies that have looked and have found whether by using transesophageal echo or at autopsy, when clots are found, they're 90% of the time found in the left atrial appendage. Now, surgeons have known this and have removed and oversown the left atrial appendage in patients who are coming for concomitant cardiac surgery. But for those who aren't going for surgery, we've needed a less invasive approach. And so I'm going to talk about left atrial appendage closure devices. And in particular, mostly I'm going to be talking about the Watchman device shown here. And so just to go over the procedure, it's a minimally invasive procedure where we come up from the vein in the leg, we come up the inferior vena cava, enter the right atrium and have a technique to pop across to the left atrium with a delivery sheath over a guide wire 
And then that sheath allows us entry to the left atrial appendage. And through that, the Watchman device is advanced, unsheathed, and then pushed in to the left atrial appendage, plugging it up. It has fabric over metal struts, and that fabric encourages an ingrowth of a skin or what we call endothelial tissue over time. And once that takes place, then the left atrial appendage is walled off, further blood can't get in, and any clots trapped in there can't get out. The procedure is quick. It takes a, 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 only about an hour and a half in the laboratory. We do the procedure under anesthesia, and we have the advantage of transesophageal echo while we're doing the procedure that gives us multiplanar views, shows us that the device is well seated, sealing up the left atrial appendage, and we, we get these lovely three-dimensional transesophageal echo images shown in the right panel that make it look like the base of an acorn plugging up the ostium, the mouth of the left atrial appendage. Now, the device uh, and the strategy of left atrial appendage closure was studied in two pivotal trials dating back again about a decade ago, the PROTECT AF and the PREVAIL study. They were similar. Collectively, they enrolled about 1,100 patients who were randomized to either receiving the Watchman device or staying on an anticoagulant. At, at, in that era, the anticoagulant that was used was warfarin or Coumadin. The endpoints of each study was slightly different, but basically looking for strokes during follow-up. And a nice study combined the results of these two clinical trials and found that when you look at all strokes, the efficacy of Watchman versus Warfarin or Coumadin was neutral, which is fine. It's as effective as being on long-term anticoagulation, but the risk of hemorrhagic stroke and major bleeding was less, meaning favors Watchman over being left on anticoagulation. And so in 2015, now um, eight years ago, the FDA approved the Watchman device indicated in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation with an increased risk of stroke, which our um, medical community and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services interprets as a CHADS fast risk score or of three or higher. And for patients who are suitable for anticoagulation, but have an appropriate reason to seek non-pharmacologic alternative to anticoagulation. Now, the recommended management is that patients are on their blood thinner, either the old-fashioned Coumadin or a newer medicine. In practice, we tend to use the novel oral anticoagulants like Eliquis, and even in reduced dose that we keep going for at least uh, six weeks or 40, about 45 days post-implant. We get a follow-up standalone transesophageal echo at that point. And if there's no significant leak of blood around the device, if the left atrial appendage is well sealed, then we can switch uh, from the um, Coumadin or Eliquis to a combination of Plavix and aspirin, platelet inhibitors, or many patients prefer to just remain on low-dose Eliquis. And then at six months, in any case, we switch to just baby aspirin. Incidentally, Last year, the FDA uh, approved a strategy of using just Plavix and aspirin for six months instead of Coumadin or Eliquis, and then switching to baby aspirin again at six months. Now that time is intended to allow the Watchman device to endothelialize, to develop that skin over the fabric so that the risk of a uh, small thrombus forming on the device itself has already uh, passed. Now, since the pivotal trials that demonstrated efficacy and safety of the Watchman device. There have been a number of clinical trials um, after the device was FDA approved. This is one published already six years ago in about 3,800 patients showing high implant success, a low risk of complications. There can be a little bit of blood leakage uh, causing a pericardial effusion requiring drainage at the time of about 1%, very low procedure-related stroke risk. And this post-market approval study was, con was conducted uh, in an era with um, still the old form of the device. Let me see, I'm not able to advance slides. 
the original Watchman device had um, sharper struts on a stiffer um, uh, scaffold of uh, metal. The newer Watchman device is softer, more flexible with um, very fine uh, uh, barbs that hold the device in place with very few complications. This uh, version of the Watchman device was approved in 2020. It's all that we implant now and the procedure is uh, uh, quick uh, and very safe with very few complications. I will say that there's a newer device um, that's been approved. It's actually been around for a while in clinical trials called the Amplatzer Amulet device. It was approved by the FDA in 2021. It may have advantages in some particular uh, anatomies of the left atrial appendage, uh, that are shallow, for example, uh, but it does have a uh, stiffer scaffolding with sharper barbs, and there have been uh, an increased number of uh, complications in early clinical trials with this device. Both the Watchman and the Amulet are sized to the individual patient. They come in different sizes, and we obtain a CAT scan prior to implant and transesophageal echo, as I mentioned, during implant. And we use those images to choose the right size device for the individual patient. I'll say that there's another type of closure device that's largely fallen away called the Lariat device. I mentioned this because many patients ask about it. It's a system for tying off the left atrial appendage from the outside, leaving no hardware uh, touching the blood on the inside. But the implant procedure is substantially more complicated, requires both accessing the heart from inside and from outside. And the strategy of closing off the left atrial appendage in this way, while, um, in, while, while intuitively appealing, has not been shown in any randomized clinical trials to actually prevent stroke in the same way that randomized clinical trials were conducted for the Watchman device. So just to summarize and show the uh, Johns Hopkins experience with left atrial appendage occlusion procedures, um, over the years, starting with mostly um, Larry devices and then growing to Watchman's, over the last five or six years, we've implanted uh, quite a few. We're up to over 400 Watchman devices implanted. Um, uh, I implant the majority of them, but I have colleagues uh, who uh, do so as well. Uh, and in total, we're, as I said, up to about uh, up to over 400 Watchmans and uh, on track to beat uh, last year's numbers this year. So to conclude, the left atrial appendage closure has emerged as an alternative to oral anticoagulation for stroke prevention. The Watchman is shown to be at least equivalent to oral anticoagulation in randomized clinical trials. The pr procedure is quick and, and attendant with low risk. The Watchman is FDA approved for patients with a history of atrial fibrillation who have elevated stroke risk and are able to tolerate short-term anticoagulation or the combination of Plavix and aspirin, which are platelet inhibitors. And then the newer device, the Amplast or Amulet device is FDA approved and may have advantages for some left atrial appendage anatomies, especially shallow, what we call chicken wing anatomy, but has some increased risk of pericardial effusion. And uh, with that, I'll stop. And, uh, and uh, I think we're at a point where we can entertain uh, questions. Yes, thank you. Great job. So, um, and either one of you can jump in um, if you're comfortable answering. So if someone is struggling with just 10 pounds to lose and hasn't been able to for years, should they consider weight loss appetite suppression as you suggested? Uh, I mean, one, I don't think 10 pounds is the kind of weight loss that makes any difference in terms of atrial fibrillation. You know, the data says that if you're overweight, I mean, generally we want your body mass index to be less than 27. You know, if your body mass index is 30, 35, 40, 50, whatever, then you're significantly obese and overweight. And from an AFib perspective, you know, dropping your weight from 390 pounds to 380 pounds just isn't going to do it. You got to lose about 10%. So you have, that's what's important. And, and, met, and very few people are able to lose weight just with pure willpower. So it doesn't really matter. 
how you do it. I mean, you know, count your calories, exercise more. I'm no expert on on these different weight weight loss formulas or whatever you can get. In general, I'm not in favor of that. But these new um, this new GLP drug, I think, is the new kid on the block. And increasingly, when I have patients with real problems with weight, particularly if they have diabetes or pre-diabetes, I'm sending them off to the, to my colleagues that that manage these drugs. And it's remarkable the kind of weight loss that patients are achieving. But again, it's it's sort of a new part of the journey. They are associated with some side effects, particularly nausea, I think is the most common. Not everyone gets it. Some people get them. And also, it's not like you can, we don't know for sure if you lose your 50 pounds, can you then stop the drug or will the weight pop right back on like so many other weight loss programs? Yeah, that makes sense. Well, thank you. So do we know anything about long-term, and by long-term, we mean like several decades, um, impact to the heart and its function of having had both cryo and RF ablations? Oh, well, we know that, I mean, AFib ablation first started being performed about 25 years ago. So Ron and I have been doing that procedure at Hopkins for more than 25 years. And, and you, you know, there's no late problems that develop in terms of your heart doesn't rip a hole in it or some catastrophe 20 years later. I mean, AFib can come back, you do the procedure, <clears throat> the success rates I told you are at one year. And if you're doing well after the procedure of one year, there's about a 2% per year risk of recurrence because AFib is age related. It's like cancer in remission. We do the procedure, we put you on the medicine, we put your AFib in remission. We buy you a better quality of life, but you can't ever assume that the AFib is not going to come back 5, 10, 20 years later, particularly if you gain 50 pounds and start drinking heavily. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so our next question, thank you. You're doing an amazing job. This is so uh, educational. So if someone's been treated with ablation successfully for AFib three to four years prior to a stroke, is it possible that the clot was hanging out in the LAA all of that time? Um, this person's, uh, this patient's calcium score had been almost zero four months prior to the stroke, so it's hard to imagine what might have caused the clot. Ron, do you want to take that? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, the, the clots are not made of calcium, so I don't think the calcium scores is is what's relevant here. I th I think a common misconception is that AFib causes clots that cause stroke. They may, they may have some causative effect, but in 2023, we have a different way of looking at it. We know that AFib is associated with stroke. We know that AFib identifies patients who are at risk for stroke, but it appears not to be the actual literal cause of stroke. And that was the very reason why in my talk, I presented those two studies, the trends in the ASSERT study, because it's quite clear that people with a history of AFib remain at risk for stroke, even when they're in normal rhythm, even when they're not in atrial fibrillation. Now, we don't know if that risk persists forever uh, when people stay in normal rhythm. And it may be that ablation or other strategies to suppress atrial fibrillation will allow that risk of atrial fibrillation, oh, that risk of clot formation and stroke to vanish over time. We really don't know, but we do have strong evidence that people with intermittent atrial fibrillation, even if they haven't had atrial fibrillation for many months, are still at risk for stroke. And that was the point of those studies. So is it possible that the clot just formed new years after an ablation in that left atrial appendage even if there was no atrial fibrillation, that's possible. The other possibility is that we get rid of a lot of the atrial fibrillation with ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs, but not all of it. So to the extent that atrial fibrillation itself, itself may also have some causative role, it may not be all the way eliminated with uh, even with our best treatment strategies. It's also important to be aware there's a new study that we're just about to launch called the REACT AFib study, which is a big national study actually led by Rod Passman at Northwestern. And this is a fascinating study that's looking at what's called pill in the pocket anticoagulation. So you, everyone has an Apple Watch. If the Apple Watch shows AFib, you go on the blood thinner for 30 days. 
If you have no AFib after 30 days, you stop the blood thinner. So that's one group. And the other group stays on the anticoagulant all the time. The standard of care, as Ron told you, we use today. And at the end of the day, they'll compare the rates of stroke and bleeding and so forth over time. So this is about a three or 4,000 patient study over five years. So in five years or eight years, we'll have the answer. Till then, stay tuned. But if you like clinical trials and uh, you like, you, you're interested, you, you don't mind an Apple Watch, uh, then, then you may be interested in this study, which is going to be starting in, probably in about a month at Hopkins. Great, actually, you know, great segue into the next question, which was exactly that. And so this uh, individual is um, wondering how one can participate in the study you just mentioned. Well, if you're interested in participating, just send me an email and we'll get you on the list. As soon as the study opens, we'll have our research coordinators reach out and uh, see if you're a candidate. And if you are, sign you up. That'd be wonderful. Wonderful. That's great. So our next question, and I'm taking them in order for our audience to be fair, because we may not have time for all of them. But the next question is, why use the LA closure when ablation will stop the AFib? Well, I think this, this goes to the same question that I had just answered. Um, uh, it, it, it isn't clear that a complete elimination of atrial fibrillation eliminates the stroke risk. You know, the question is, is a question that, uh, that Dr. Hawkins and I are asked all the time. You know, why do we put people uh, back on anticoagulation or suggest the watchman as an alternative, even after a very successful ablation procedure? And the answer is that we're not convinced that stroke risk vanishes, even if AFib is completely abolished. It might reduce it. We don't know. But there's clearly there are clearly studies that show that you don't need to be in AFib to develop a clot and end up with a stroke. And so the, at, at the present time, we view ablation and uh, other strategies to suppress AFib primarily as a way to uh, reduce or eliminate the symptoms associated with atrial fibrillation and maybe the downstream complications as well. But we view anticoagulation uh, or the Watchman device as proven ways to mitigate the stroke risk. And our next question is about a low risk patient. And I think what you're saying is um, in, in lieu or before of ablation, you would probably recommend uh, the anticoagulants or the watchman before ablation for a low risk patient. I, mean, I think it's important to think that there's the issue of stroke, you should think about separately from the issue of controlling your AFib and rhythm control. So as Ron said, anyone with AFib, you want to think about your stroke risk, which is based on that CHADS vast score. So you can add up your points, come up with your score, and that will guide your annual risk of stroke. And you should think about that separately. That's one question. What are you going to do about stroke prevention? If you're low risk, you don't have to do anything. If you're high risk, you can go on a blood thinner or you can have the watchman procedure put in. But then the second question is, what are you going to do, if anything, about the atrial fibrillation? Are you just going to slow it down or are you going to try to prevent it with medicines or with procedures? And increasingly, the, all the studies are suggesting that ablation is a better way to control AFib. But also, new studies are all suggesting that it's best to treat AFib earlier than later. You know, once there's someone stuck in AFib for two, three, four, five years, it's sort of too light. The horse has long since left the barn. Because when you're in AFib continuously, the atrium stretches, scars, and dilates, and it becomes much harder to reverse that. And, and so anyhow, so the current trends are treat AFib early, uh, maybe try one drug, but if one drug doesn't work, get the ablation done. That's really the best way to control the AFib. But a separate issue is the stroke prevention, and just think of that differently. And what's the average time between, if you had to have multiple ablation procedures, what is the average time between procedures or does it depend on the patient? No, we always, we like to space them out. I mean, you have a procedure, an AFib ablation procedure, the first two to three months is the healing phase where your heart's inflamed, you can still have AFib for the first two or three months. So the last thing you want to do is rush in a month later and do another procedure, which may not be needed. So you wait absolutely at least three months, but it's usually six months to 12 months. You may try a medicine. You may give more time for the inflammation to drop down. 
you, you know, there's there's also a built-in delay factor where there's a waiting list for the procedure. So even if you wanted it done tomorrow, that you can't have it done tomorrow because the, the procedure rooms are filled up. But it's important. You don't want to do multiple rapid succession ablations. That would be kind of nuts. That's fair. Um, and is ablation for, uh, the next question says intermittent, but I'm not sure what that means. Ron, do you want to? It, for, for ablation for intermittent, uh, or what we call paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Uh, that, that, that's that's where we have the best results. It's actually um, the, the most, I think the patient, many of the patients who are most symptomatic from atrial fibrillation are those who are going in and out and in and out of atrial fibrillation, what we call intermittent or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And honestly, where we have our best success with ablation is when it is intermittent. It's patients who are in AFib persistently, particularly if they've been it for many months or years where ablation is less successful. But interestingly, many patients adapt to, to AFib and may um, be rendered asymptomatic if we control the heart rate if they've been in AFib for a long time. So sometimes the treatment goals change. But the short answer is yes, intermittent AFib is, is, is very much the, the target for ablation. One of the a common way for an AFib patient to present is you go in for your colonoscopy because you're over 50 and lo and behold, you're found to be an AFib or you go in for your annual physical examination, you're feeling fine, you're found to be an AFib. In the old days, the approach to that situation would be to say, well, the patient has no symptoms. It was picked up sort of on, by accident. Let's just put them on a blood thinner. If they need a blood thinner, slow the AFib down with a medicine and tell them to have a good life. What's really changed is now we know it's best to, to sort of go after that AFib. We don't want to just do nothing and then wait two, three years and then the patient develops heart failure or develops some other problem because you it's best to treat it early. So increasingly, we'll take that kind of patient and do a trial of sinus rhythm. We do a cardioversion. We shock them back to normal rhythm, see if they feel better. We have long discussions about the implications of AFib. And more and more patients are opting for sinus rhythm and then I think, again, one of the things that I think catches my patient's attention the most is when you tell them about the link between AFib and dementia, and it's striking the data coming out. You know, they've done studies on brain, brain blood flow when you're in normal rhythm or when you're in AFib, like before and after a cardioversion. Soon as you go into AFib, your brain blood flow changes and decreases. So, you know, there's all this research going on and there's more and more patients describing, oh, when I'm normal rhythm, I can remember my kids' names and whatever, but when I'm in AFib, I can't remember, whatever. These, so it's a very exciting area of research. And I think it's one more reason to try to combat AFib and live a life in normal rhythm if you can. Well, that, that definitely makes sense. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we have one more question um, and it's addressed to Dr. Berger. You showed a 3% procedural stroke rate with the Watchman device. What is the mechanism of stroke in these patients? Is thromboembolism the cause? And the, does the device dislodge left atrial thrombus? And does the 3% procedural risk take away the claim of Watchman being equivalent to Coumadin? Okay, so I saw that question. <laughs> I, I saw that question coming. So I said, did I say 3%? No, it was three. I think this is the, the, the yes. question is referring to the slide where the three was three out of 3,800 uh, patients, a little less than 0.1%, a little less than one in a thousand. Um, I, I, I haven't had any patients have a periprocedural uh, stroke. And, and, and I think this is incredibly rare. And again, this is even with the older Watchman device. So it, it's not 3%, it's less than 0.1%. But, um, but we do worry that patients may present with a um, uh, uh, a thrombus in the left atrial appendage. And we are going, as you saw in the, uh, in the animation, in the video, we're entering that left atrial appendage in order to place the watchman. So if there's a thrombus in there, if there's a clot in there, there is the risk we're gonna dislodge it and actually provoke a stroke with the procedure itself. So to mitigate that risk, number one, we have patients on anticoagulation before during and after the procedure, at least for a while, skipping just one dose, one pill of anticoagulation the morning of the procedure. Second, we like to get a CAT scan of the heart the day of the procedure. We have a CAT scanning 
uh, CAT scanner right near our procedure room. We get that CAT scanner. It shows the, the size, shape, and takeoff angle of the left atrial appendage, but also allows us to see whether or not the left atrial appendage is harboring a clot on the day that patients come for the procedure. And then finally, before we actually poke into the vein and up into the heart, we have the patients under anesthesia with a transesophageal echo probe giving us high uh, resolution ultrasound pictures to make sure that there's no clot sitting in the left atrial appendage when we embark on watchman placement. And I have had, rarely, but I've had patients where we discover a clot sitting in the left atrial appendage before we get started with the procedure and we abort. We intensify the blood thinners, bring the patient back, and have had very successful watchman implant procedures. So we are cautious, but yes, uh, uh, ruling out thrombus in the left atrial appendage before we get started playing around in there is an important uh, safety aspect of the procedural planning. Well, thank you both so much. Thanks for the clarification. Appreciate it. And it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I am going to uh, thank you both for your time and your talent. And we'd also like to thank all of our wonderful attendees for joining us this evening and for asking such wonderful questions. Uh, I will share a follow-up email with you that will include a recording of the program along with a list of resources and our event schedule. And we really do hope you will join us at a future webinar. These are such a pleasure. And um, again, uh, Dr. Berger, Dr. Calkins, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Have a good evening. Stay well.